Hello, everybody. Welcome to Real Estate Investing for Busy Professionals. This is a group that, of uh, professionals from different companies that get together. Today, we have a special treat. We have Charlotte Dunford, and she's going to be speaking to us about niche mobile home markets. And so, Charlotte, why don't you take it away? Perfect. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, my name is Charlotte Dunford. Um, I am, like you said, like Daniel said, uh, we're in the niche uh, mobile home parks um, where we are at um, Johns Creek Capital. We are actually a niche within the niche. We focus on small to medium level mobile home parks. So a short introduction on myself. I am the managing partner at Johns Creek Capital. We started buying mobile home parks in late 2019, and we officially founded Johns Creek Capital along with my partner, who has a very strong engineering and construction background. Uh, a lot together started Johns Creek Capital in early 2020, and we have grew from really two parks to today 26 mobile home parks. We just closed our 26th one um, a week ago. Probably we're going to uh, buy another one in about two weeks. Um, that would be our 27th. So we're growing pretty rapidly. We've got, you know, over uh, $4.8 million in investor subscription. So, so what drew us- I don't know why I can't hear. Sorry, can you hear me well? I can hear you. Can everybody else hear you? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we can. Yep. Okay, perfect. I'm so what drew me, what was attractive to me um, originally from mobile home parks, I was actually working um, at a corporate job right after um, graduating from college. I was you know, 23 and working as a business analyst for a year and a half. And at the same time, like you guys, you know, you guys are busy professionals. Um, you know, I was looking to invest in, mo uh, sorry, um, real estate. Um, but after two deals, you know, as a newly grad, uh, my salary at the time, you know, wasn't enough to uh, fulfill my vision or ambition for more, a bigger portfolio. So I pretty much took a jump of quitting my full-time job and into mobile, um, real estate uh, in full-time. Originally, I wanted to do multifamily. Um, and uh, at the time, I found myself you know, stuck in the multifamily market because I was so young and, you know, the big boys or the people who have experience in multifamily have been at it for decades and years and years. And for me, you know, I couldn't even speak to a broker without them asking me for the experiences I had in multifamily, but apparently I only had a single family home and a duplex under my belt at the time. So then I found mobile home parks. So it was really a long ignored sector where not many people were talking about it. You know, people were talking about flipping homes, single family homes, multifamily, but mobile home parks, it was barely anybody understood it and people didn't know about it. And it was a very niche and still is to today. But at the time in 2019, when I first started, it really was niche. And I started searching for mobile home parks and I can't, I, I can I kind of found that I was able to get really, really attractive terms and really attractive pricing. So one of the first deals that we did was, you know, 10% cap rate, three, it was seller financing with only 20% down, 3% interest rate and 30 year amortization and a 10 year blue. So those are kind of the terms that you can't beat even with a commercial lending, bank lending. So that's what really attracted me to it. And I was able to get into it because the barrier to, to entry was, was low. And um, that kind of is how I started. But in general, you know, mobile home parks with kind of a recession is already in place, inflation going up, rates going up, everything is kind of crazy. Um, mobile home parks, they provide a kind of a re recession resistant asset. It really is a, it's a recession, res I wouldn't say recession proof, but it's definitely recession resistant asset class. So the first is this demand for affordable housing. We actually get more phone calls during a recession, when economy goes down a little, we get more phone calls to rent our lots and mobile home parks because people are looking for a less expensive housing option. And when your, let's say, your, your paycheck goes down or your saving is depleting and you, you, you're not probably not looking to move into a bigger mansion, you're probably looking to scale down a little bit. So there, we actually get a lot more calls for them. And uh, the demand 
for affordable housing and this affordable housing crisis in, in America is, is ever growing. And I, I don't see that not being a problem anytime soon. So the demand is there, right? So the second thing is the supply is limited. There's restricted limited supply because zoning offices and legislatures, cities and county officials in general, they don't like mobile home parks. It's because first of all, the stigma, right? That we all know about the stigma of mobile home parks and they just don't see mobile home parks as something positive for the city. But what we're able to do is that we try to talk to the officials and let them make them understand that we're doing the city a favor, trying to solve a problem the city is facing, which is the affordable housing crisis all across the nation. That, that's a thing. That's a problem everywhere. So the limited supply is extremely difficult to build new mobile home parks. So they're not really building anymore, not at any speed that will catch up with demand. So the limited supply plus the ever-growing demand make this industry extremely profitable just by pure economics, right? Supply, demand, supply is not growing. Demand is growing like crazy. So price is always going up. And like I mentioned earlier, there is attractive capitaliza um, capitalization, cap rates and financing options. So we are able to get those parks until still today in 2022, even though the market has gone a little bit more heated than before, but it's still compared to other you know, sectors, uh, mobile home park are still very much a blue ocean. So we, we really love, you know, at John's Creek Capital, we love the blue ocean strategy. So we try to avoid extreme competition where, you know, we don't want to buy an apartment building in the heart of Manhattan where everybody's putting a thousand bids on it. So for us, we're able to get higher cap rates going in, setting the deal up for success. You know the saying that, you know, you you make the money when you buy. That's really true. After you buy the thing, it might be too late, whatever you do. So you really want to get into it with success. And the first step to do doing that is to get at a really attractive cap rate. So generally we focus on parks with seven to 10% or higher cap rate, uh, which is you know almost unheard of in a lot of other asset classes. So that's why it's attractive. And another bigger, another thing is stability of the tenant, right? So a mobile home park, what it is, is really a land business, is a parking lot. So the closest thing I would say mobile home park is similar to is a parking lot. So the, the homes, you know, they are really treated as cars, they're vehicles. Um, they're not RVs, but they're, they're mobile homes, they're vehicles. So actually the title to a mobile home, you actually, you, you register them at, at a DMV, which, you know, further explains that they're a vehicle. So, um, you know, the name may be a little bit confusing because they're called mobile homes, but let me tell you this, they're anything but mobile because they are mobile in the sense that you can move them, but it's so extremely difficult to move them. 95% of mobile homes that make it into a mobile home park never get out of it. It sounds kind of scary, but that's really, that's that's true. Uh, what it, why it is, is because um, first of all, it's about seven to $10,000 to hire a mover to travel your, put your home, unhook your mobile home, put it on the truck and tra like, Toll it away. That's ten thousand dollars because they're so expensive to move. If you're traveling any kind of distance, number two, if the homes are old, you can't even move them without them shattering. You know, driving more than two miles per hour. So, you know, they're extremely difficult to move and extremely, you know, expensive to move. So it's not really cost effective. Let's say you raise rent for fifty dollars for each tenant. If they don't want to pay the fifty dollars rent increase. Um, they really wouldn't want to spend ten thousand dollars. They, they would. They they have the ten thousand dollars for someone who lives in a mobile home park to move their home to avoid a fifty dollars rent increase. So that gives them some stability. And in the case where they do move, usually what we try to do we have this thing called the first route of refusal. Um, we buy the home from them and lease it to uh, kind of a, like a rent to own structure, uh, sell it to someone else. So that immediately, you know avoids a vacant lot or we encourage them, which is the best way to, um, you know, encourage them to connect with the buyer of the mobile home. And we just get the lot rent. Like I said, it's a parking lot business. So we don't want to deal with the, you know, furnace, furnace, uh, fixing furnaces, water line broke, uh, or, 
um, you know, fix, fixing a refrigerator. So it's, it's less of a rental business, but more of a parking lot business. And low cost per unit, like I said, you know, you can buy a mobile home park. Right now, actually, we're, we just closed on a park. Um, we're under contract for a park that is, um, we, we're getting it to eight, uh, for $300,000 roughly, but that park is, uh, 12 lots. So, you know, the, 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 the cost per lot is really, really low compared to uh, cost per unit uh, for other like multifamily apartment buildings or, or other s- types of really heated markets. And we've gotten really cheap, a lot cheaper ones too. Um, I think one of the last deals that we did last year was um, a park in Montana. That one was only $6,000 per law. So, you know, it really depends on the market. So that's how you get the really attractive cap rate going in. And expense ratio is lower, um, not really for small parks, but for a slightly bigger park, you can get around 30 to 40% expense ratio because you don't have a lot of repairs and maintenance bills. There are only certain fixed bills that you have to pay insurance, um, taxes, and bills like that. Um, so that's why mobile home parks are attractive, both from a personal prep perspective and just generally this market, right? So, so what I'm going to show is a project that we did in um, late 2021. Um, this is an actual project that we presented to investors. This one has already been closed and investors, it was fully subscribed to. But this one, you know, I thought it would be a good example of a representative of what a mobile home park project would look like, right? So this one was a very small park, right? So mobile home park is anything, uh, three units, four units and above is categorized as mobile home park. This park is actually doing really well. Um, It's only five lots, um, was extremely, you know, high cap rate to get. It was was really attractive and it was in a good market. It was um, in a MSA with a population of over 100,000. We actually have a 15, 15 parameter um, is kind of a correct criteria to uh, qualify our deals. You know, we have thousands of deal, deals as the deal flow flow to our desk and, you know, they come from everywhere. So how do we qualify the deals? Market is actually one of the, one of the important ones that we look at is that it has to be in a town. It has to have a really good town dy- dynamic. You can't be in the middle of nowhere and have five lots. So this one has good, you know, in, it's actually part of MSA, uh, with a population over 100,000. That's a magic number, 100,000. So that means there is a town there and there are there, there, there will be a good solid tenant base. So the highlights of this one, 100, 100% occupied. Okay, so it's a pretty stable asset and all tenant-owned homes. This is important. A tenant-owned home is a home that's owned by a tenant. A park-owned home is a home that's not owned by a tenant that you're renting and that's not somewhere we want to go. We want to... We want the tenants to own the homes because they will take care of their own repairs and maintenance. And that's what was keeping the expense ratios low. So that's a really good point. A good, you know, check that parameter. And this one, public utilities. So this is actually extremely important. They have public utilities, all direct, sorry, all direct build. That means they are directly billed for water, electric trash to the tenants and we don't have to pay for that. That's actually a huge expense that that we don't have to take on. And the biggest money loser in the mobile home park industry is utilities. So if you have utility problem, let's say your utility utility lines are have a ton of deferred maintenance and they are costing you so much money, you probably won't make too much money from this asset class. So if they're, the utility lines are fine, you dodge the biggest money loser in the industry, then that's a big plus. So public utilities, all direct bills. So that checks as well. Long-term tenant base with no rents owed. That is extremely important because we see the tenants at mobile home parks as a stakeholder. Because you think about it, they own the homes and they're there, they're hard to move. And if you have some bad actors in a mobile home park where they don't pay you rent, they are facing eviction, they are owing you thousands and thousands of dollars in debt, especially with the eviction moratorium, they're just going to walk away and you're stuck with that debt. And what are you going to do with a vacant home? You know, you don't even own the home. And if you don't own the home, you have to go through the entire legal process for the court to give you a ruling called the abandoned home. So, you know, that is another legal cost, another whole nightmarish process. So the important long-term tenant base with no rents owed. 
So that means those are quality tenants, and as you know, if you own real estate, you know that a good tenant is as good as gold, especially mobile home parks. Now, room to move rents to up towards、uh, market rent, which is pretty standard in any kind of you know evaluation of an asset. That、um, market rent, there's always room. That's the meat on the bone, right? You can raise rent a little bit. Biggest money maker in mobile home park is mobile home park industry is raising lot rent. But I'm saying that because You know, we're buying a lot from mom and pop owners, right? And those mom and pop owners tend not to raise rents. They kind of just they know the tenants. They kind of stagnant for years, not raising rent while their costs are going up, and that's how they get themselves into bankruptcy. So, you know, the meat on the bone is already big because the rent is already way low. You know, the in the southeast where where we're based.、Um, We don't exclusively buy the southeast, but that is where we're based. We're based in southeast, and the average lot rent is one hundred fifty dollars, two hundred. That's very low. That's extremely. In the Midwest, you're looking at three hundred, three hundred fifty. So that is low to start with. We usually increase rents immediately after acquisition, according to state law. We have to give the tenants thirty to sixty days notice, and we usually try not to raise a rent more than fifty dollars per year to keep everything good, especially with with inflation. You gotta keep up with the costs, right? And you also have to deliver on the things that you said you would do for the tenants: cosmetic upgrades, better management,、uh, better、uh, lawn care, better. You know, just housekeeping stuff, right? And low expense ratio, once stabilized,、um, that's already di- been discussed, and the upward trend in property appreciation. That's in the market. You have to look at the real estate appreciation in the past、uh, past ten years or cu- past five years to see are is are are the properties depreciating or are people moving out of out of the area or are they moving in or you know is the housing market going up or down? So that's also a consideration. The biggest thing is that they're one hundred percent. Occupy an alternate home, public utilities all directly built. Those two alone, that's big, big pluses. So this one, we actually raised ninety nine thousand. The sales price was lower than that, but we totally rate. We're going to go into how the capital was broken down, and if you were buying a mobile home park yourself, right, how you should budget. For the mobile home park, because it's not just the sales price. There's reserves. There's the value add budget. There is,、um, you know, legal costs. There, there's so many things that you have to consider. So this one, the considered internal rate, rate all our investments, you know, for mobile home parks, you know, we we look at the IRR internal rate of return within five to eight years. But this one's probably it's shorter. Most of our,、uh, most of our investments are three to five years. This one. We're probably going to exit within five years or so. So, but we just, you know, markets are always changing. So,、um, so the target the whole time, the internal rate of return within five years over fifteen percent, fifteen to twenty, and then targeted equity multiples one point five to two point five. Um, so and those could change based on due diligence and the strategy. If you buy your own mobile home park, just like you know we do it because you know our our clients are. Extremely busy,、um, and they don't really want to deal with the repairs and maintenance and tenants and all the headaches. So, we're transitioning of this undervalued mobile home park into a desired residential community. So, it's all about boosting that、um, pride of ownership. You want this mobile home community to look like a neighborhood that you want to live in. Right, so think about those single-family home neighborhoods. You know, they have a beautiful sign. They probably have some fences. They have a security gate. You know, not necessarily have to go to that level, but you want to make it more desirable. So that's the goal. That's always the goal in any kind of value-add mobile home park kind of a strategy. So the initial approach is increase rent and slow and steady rent increases. You know, you have to be slow and steady. You can't be too fast. People will move, and it it would not be really fair for the tenants either. So those are just some of our own stuff. But、uh, so this one,、um, we did some research in the market. So is the county Tazewell is the county seat of the county. And the town itself has forty-two thousand residents, so it's pretty, pretty, you know, a growing area. And we look at the median home price, right? Because it's important that it's one hundred over a hundred thousand dollars in the town. Because if you have、uh, the median median home price is only fifty thousand dollars, why would they want to buy a forty thousand dollars mobile home and live in your mobile home park rather than a single family home? So. You know we're in affordable housing、uh, 
industry. So you you cannot you have to have some gap between the housing product you offer versus other housing products. For example, the apartment. So in town, the three bedroom apartment rents eight hundred eighty two dollars. The current lot rent is only one fifty. You want to be different. You want to have a huge huge gap between what other housing options, home and apartment. Versus your mobile home park lot rent because if there is not a big difference in what they're paying, why would they want to move into your park? You have to make it attractive, make your product the most valuable in the market. So, and we researched um, different employers um, in the in in the town. So those are some you know Walmart is really good because you know the Walmart effect is the a Walmart is usually built where. Economic opportunities are happening, especially in mobile home parks. So the closer you are to a Walmart, it sounds silly, but、um, the better you will be, you will be、um, from a you know employer perspective. So we have the strategy right is into three different periods. So the first period, this is actually applicable to many different types of real estate investments. So. The first is the stabilization period, right? We're establishing relationships, we're holding those meet and greets, and we're telling them, "This is what you need to do. You know, you need to sign this lease, and this is what it means, right? You need to follow our rules. So two rules, right? So no pay, no stay. If you don't pay, you can't stay, obviously. And no play, no stay, meaning that if you don't play by our rules, you can't stay. So setting those expectations because relationships with tenants as well is all about expectations. So we set those expectations. Early on, right after we acquire, we want to be fair, right? So the stabilization period is just, you know, doing the initial work, you know, cosmetic upgrades, getting getting those set up, getting those ready to go forward, right? Stabilization. So this is where the returns stay a little low from at the beginning. Very normal stabilization. The second period is maximization. During this period, the rent structure approaches market conditions. That's where actually value adds are starting to happen. And things are starting to change, and、um, you know that 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 this is the after the stabilization period where、um, we are actually you know、um, starting to take more more and more actions towards value add. And then the third one, the optimization period, is a、um, like like you can see here is the last stage of the value add. That's where things start to stabilize just a little bit. And to see there's anything else we can add value to before we exit or hold for a long long time this asset. So the three stages: stabilization, maximization, and optimization. So and there are a lot of things that can happen in real estate, especially in mobile home park. There are so many nightmare stories that you know I can tell, and you know we have we've had deaths in our mobile home parks during COVID. From COVID, we've had all sorts of problems.、Um, so to counter and hedge the risks against those worst case scenarios, so those are some of the major scenarios and the contingency plans associated with them. So a major recession. We wrote this up. Late last year, so I think we're kind of heading to that direction. We're already in the middle of it, depending on the market you're in, right? So a major recession re occurs, causing all tenants, like I said, this is the worst case scenario, right? All tenants to lose employment, and all the mobile home park repossess, resulting in an empty park. So if this happens, it's definitely going to be a process. It's not going to occur like overnight. Everybody lose their job, and you know. They all leave the home, so we stay very closely communicated with the tenants. So when they're beginning to have trouble to pay rent on time, that shows some signs that there might be something going on with their financial situation. So we usually discuss with them with the option of purchasing their home at a discount. So we're already kind of buying the asset at a discount, and you know, a first right of refusal.、Um, it is a place in our lease to make sure that we have this option initially. So, and then we can try to sell this home to a new tenant because in a recession, like I said earlier, they are trying to look to you know look for a less expensive option. So then we will not have empty park. But again, this is a process. As long as we're prepared,、um, there will be things that we can do to hedge against this risk. Number two, right? Tenants are unable to make the higher rent payments. Let's、like、say we, we raise rent and re resulting in reduced income. 
Right. So here's the thing: in mobile home parks and other apartment buildings or whatever you're looking at, you know, tenants don't really move for a simple lot increase. They move for other reasons, right? And um, they're very low to begin with. Um, an increase of twenty five dollars to fifty dollars per month. Is not going to be too difficult to pay versus you know if you live in an apartment building, right? The increase per year is going to be two to three hundred dollars, if not more. So in this case, it's really not a lot. And twenty five dollars a month is like what? It's like a Chili's dinner, or you know, if a fancy Chili's dinner is fifty dollars, right, for two people. So well, I don't know. Have been there for a while. So, but I think it would be. It's not really really hard to handle. So. But number three, the scenario is a major catastrophic event occurs, such as park-wide fire, or a tornado, or a hurricane. It, it happened, like the one that happened in Kentucky. It was very close to our park. Now, so we tend not to want to buy in really, really in, in areas like Louisiana,、uh, places where those sort of things are so common. And we also require all our tenants to carry homeowner's insurance. Remember, they own the home, so this is their home. They carry homeowner insurance either in the event of a fire. The insurance will cover partial or full replacement of their home. And in the case of a park on home, meaning we own, we actually had this happen to us: a fire burned down the home, and we own the home. So the insurance company covered that. So we also carry property insurance, two types of insurance: liability insurance and property insurance. So the property insurance should have at least cover part of the、uh, the cost to replace the home or fix the home. So, and the financial、uh, the financing of a deal structure. This deal we got for seventy nine thousand dollars, really good deal, right? And the capital raise we raised twenty thousand dollars additional to cover reserves and other funds. And those are for so the use of capital, right? Cash sale. This is what we got it for. Due diligence. You want to get due diligence. Budget about two to three thousand dollars, if not more, for due diligence.、Um, that covers an environmental study, electrical inspection, camera job, plumbing inspection. If it is on septic tanks, make sure you、um, you know inspect the septic tanks,、um, and you want to、um, definitely. Uh, there are other costs like travel costs as well, so you want to budget for that. That's due diligence. Closing costs usually pretty similar across all, all the parks. That's up to the title company for the title search, and usually the buyer pays for the title. And you know, acquisition fee paid to us usually a percentage of the price. And but value at budget because this one is pretty stabilized to begin with. There are only small things that we need to do, like adding a new sign, cosmetic upgrades, adding white fences at the front at the entrance to give it a kind of a more country. Feel and the reserves、um, is important to have some reserves、so、for a small park like this. Stabilized, you know, you don't you need you don't need twenty thousand dollars in reserve. Some parks we do have higher reserve, but this one, you know, you want to have some reserve, but not too much because all of that plays into your number as well. So those are kind of the risks and returns. So that's what it looks like, but for our investors only, you know, for for, for investors who invested with on this deal. So summary: sell in year eight. We we probably sell. Earlier than that, so that's you know what was with us, and then you know we usually provide our investors a kind of a breakdown of detailed expenses, what they're going to be looking at, exit assumption we we budgeted in the cap rate at exit, it probably could be lower or higher depending on the market conditions, sales costs and all of that. So that tells them what they're getting in yet. So that's me.、Um, like I introduced myself at the beginning. That was late last year, so I only had 20 parks. Now we have 26 to 27.、Uh, I graduated here at、um, Georgia Institute of Technology, one of top engineering schools here in the South, and graduated business major.、Um, I was born in China.、Uh, I'm not sure how much bio、uh, you guys,、uh, you know, knew about me, but、um, I was born in China. Came to the United States when I was 16 years old, and、um, I did not come with my parents. My parents just they stayed in China. I was kind of just I, I hopped on a plane and came to my host family, who I never met. So that was a, a really、um, risk-taking activity. So that's why I'm telling people that when I started Johns Creek Capital, it was not that risky because I've done a lot more risky things when I was, you know, when I was 16 and came to the United States and didn't speak English, learn everything from scratch. But I was、uh, fortunate enough to become an American citizen last year. So it was the best thing ever.、Uh, my partner, great, great、um, engineer. And with a strong construction background, he has a even you know 
some people say that you have a good story, but he's got a great story. So he worked um, many years. Um, he owned his own environmental uh, engineering company and really, really sharp guy with engineering background. Also worked in finances and construction. He owns his own construction company. He's more of the operational guy who's on the ground traveling, talking to contractors and our entire team. I don't have my, my entire team listed here, just major partners. So, you know, he he's in charge of the value add coordinator, talking to contractors. And um, I'm more in charge of the acquisition investor relationships. So his job is fixing broken assets. He can turn a broken asset around. You know, he's, he's, he's extremely sharp, extremely entrepreneurial uh, partner. Very fortunate to, to have met him. So that's our uh, value at coordinator. He is mostly in charge of um, report, report Zurich and mostly in charge of tenant um, uh, contractor relations and coordinating. Let's say if we want to move a home in to fill an empty lot, his job is to get the quotes, get the contractors lined up, get the movers lined up, budget lined up to, to do that. And we have several other team members um, that we have it on our website, but it's not added to this presentation. So the eligibility for to invest with us, but that's not really related. So um, usually for a mobile home park, uh, you're looking at 30 days of due diligence. You want to request at least 30 days due diligence. If you're getting a loan, you probably want to add a financial contingency uh, for 45 days. That's 30 days. That's 15 days after your 30 days due diligence. So you have time for a loan. Nowadays, loans are taking forever to process. So you probably want to budget more than that. And the closing timeline is usually for us because we're we're buying small parks and we 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 buy. Um, you know, with cash. So we don't really have a, a loan process to worry about. So we usually close within 45 days. But if you're buying this yourself, you might want to ask for 60 days to close. So that brings me to the end of this presentation. And um, right. Daniel, take yeah, it we've, away. We've got a take series of questions here. And, and if you have more <laughs> questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, thank you very much. That was a whirlwind tour. Um, yes. So as it happens, the very first question has to do with bank financing. How do it banks hurts. treat this kind of property for financing? So so when you're going and getting a loan, you know, mm -hmm. do, do you have to go to a particular type of bank? Is there a specialized loan? Um, do you get turned down a lot? How, do, how does that work? Yeah, so bank, bank financing, this mobile home park industry is getting more and more, you know, friendly towards the bank. The banks are getting more and more comfortable with this asset class. You know, a few years back, you probably could not get a bank loan on a small park like this, but now we've sold several parks so far and the, the buyer never had a problem with buying a small park on bank financing. Bank financing. So you're probably looking at a 30% down payment and rates are going up. So, you know, a higher, whatever interest rate you can get approved for, you know, 25 year amortization with, with bank. So actually how we got all of our deals were we got it either through cash or seller financing. So, you know, one of the first deals we got was 30% down, excuse me, 30% down, 3% interest rate, 30 year amortization and 10 year balloon. That's extremely attractive term. So, you know, with banks, they are probably more comfortable with a bigger park over 100 lots, but that's bigger, um, you know, um, I think non-recourse big lenders. That's what you're talking about. But if you want a smaller park, you know, find a local bank or find, find a bank that you have a relationship with and show them what the park can do. It really is case by case. You need to show them the NOI is there, the cap is there, they can make money. So, um, yeah, so can there are financing. Like non-recourses? Yeah. Can, can you explain what non-recourse is? So non-recourse is... Um, is, 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 is where you have, those usually happen with a bigger, bigger dollar amount of loan is that, you know, the non-recourse loan, usually the um, collateral is the asset itself. And you don't have to be a personal guarantor for the loan. And um, that's really attractive. And it's also harder because you have to be uh, buying a solid asset itself. So the bank doesn't want to go after you. If something happens, they can just repossess the the asset. But in most cases, if you're working with a small bank, if you're working with a small asset, like a small mobile home park, the bank probably wants some sort of personal guarantee saying, if you're not you are paying us, we'll have to go after you. <laughs> All right. Uh, the, Ulysses is asking, what happens if your tenants don't pay rent? I assume it's very difficult to evict tenants since they technically own the home. 
great question. So during the eviction moratorium, right, we technically cannot, cannot evict anybody. And some states lasted longer than the others. So we could not evict anybody. Tenants knew that they didn't have to, well, they you couldn't evict them. They knew that we had no ammunition. And what do you do? The, they're interpreting the eviction moratorium as I don't have to pay rent, but that's not true. The late fees, everything adds up. So we couldn't evict them. So if they're not paying, we got a lot of people, people who didn't pay during the the pandemic is not really that over, but during the heat of the pandemic, people were not paying. So what we did, you know, this is a real true test, is that we try to be advocates for tenants. We apply for rental assistance on their behalf. Or we what we did was that we either apply for rental assistance on their behalf or encourage them to apply for rental assistance. That, that got us covered for a lot of the income. But in, during normal times, if people don't pay, you can evict them. Right, you can definitely evict them. You evict a mobile home park tenant just like you would evict an apartment building tenant. It is a more complicated process after you evict them because of the nature of it. So they own the home, right? The home is the tenant. You evict them as you would evict a tenant. So you usually just go to court, you know, evict them. So the judge would order them to get out, right? So there would be they would get served, they would get, you know, you know, they would be the day, right? So people tenants who live there will be physically removed. The home will stay there if they couldn't afford to move it. Now, you go through something called a repossession process for the home. It's a legal process, some paperwork, but we've done it before. So the repossession process is when you tell the court that this home is sitting here, they're not paying rent, we want you to deem it abandoned. So the court, you just go through the motions, go through the paperwork, hire a good attorney, or you don't have to hire an attorney if you know the process. So it's pretty straightforward. So the, the, the court is going to issue you a rule, tell you that this is deemed abandoned. Now, once you get this abandonment uh, paperwork, you can sell this home. If, if there are no takers to sell this home, you can apply for title to this home. Then you own the home. Then you can sell it to someone else or rent it out. So remember, you're the landlord of this mobile home park. You have the power because you own the land. So you can definitely evict people. And there's just a process to go through. And you should encourage them to sell it to someone else so you don't have to go through that process. But there is a process. You own the land, you have the power. I was curious if there are any differences between buying a mobile home park and buying a home. Is it is it pretty much exactly the same process? You go through inspection and, and all of the same steps you would go yeah. through for a single family home or is there a difference? Well, mobile home park is somewhat of a commercial property. So it is very similar to buying any other commercial property or any you know, apartment. So, you know, but, 30, so I, with this I think you, may, maybe my question wasn't understood. I, I just mean yeah. a single home in the park. Oh, yeah, yeah. With a single home in the park, um, that no, that's that that becomes a lot easier. Mobile home park is the real is a real estate. A single home in the park is considered personal property. It's just like a tractor, just like a lawnmower, just like a car. You buy a single home in the park through a bill of sale, not as through a purchase contract. So you buy a single home in the park like how you buy buy a car. It, so, is, is there an inspection period or, or anything yeah, like you that? Can, back you can and forth definitely, yeah, yeah, you can do a seven day inspection period, but it, usually, you know, it's point of sale, bill of sale kind of process. So it's, it's, it's different. It's very different from buying an entire mobile home. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how often is sewage something that the city doesn't provide? I, I know sewage mm -hmm. systems can often be one of the more costly things that break within mobile home parks or, right. or, you know, just depending on how they're structured, it could be centralized or off grid yeah. or septic. Talk a little bit about yeah. that. So the sewage, right? So there are, it depends on the more rural areas, probably more have more septic tanks um, and septic system versus the public sewage, public lines. So, um, so that really depends on how the rural market. And then, you know, septic tanks are okay. As long as you pump them, you inspect them. But one thing we do avoid is treatment plants or a lagoon, you know, those are a million dollars to fix if you want to fix them. So they are so expensive to operate and we, we, we stay away from them. 
Um, so yeah, so that's 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 really that's really it. the rural areas probably tend to have more septic septic setup, and the more kind of urban areas, suburban, they probably have more uh, city or town sewage. You may have you may have answered this already, but where are your mobile home parks located exactly, and, and how far apart are they from each other? Right. So we have heavier presence in um, we have heavier presence in the southeast and the Midwest. Um, we t we want to to create economy of scale, right? We want to buy them closer to each other. So usually within the state, they're usually within twenty to thirty minutes drive of each other. But you know that's not for every park. We also have offshoot parks in you know one in Montana, we have another one in Arizona, we have another one in Maine. Uh, you know we have one in Wisconsin, but we have a lot in Iowa. We have a lot in South Carolina, North Carolina, Kentucky, Tennessee. You know the Southeast we have heavier presence, but for us, you know the, the management we have localized efforts. So once we go under due diligence, we try to assemble a team or try to find local contractors um, who can. Um, who, 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 who will be on our team to deal with any repairs and maintenance requests because as you know we're our, our headquarters in Georgia so it would be difficult without that localized effort for sure. Do, um, do any of those those people on the team actually live at the park or are they all off-site? Mm -hmm. Yeah we have a, a kind of a watchdog person eyes and ears of, of the park uh, usually is a tenant who is has a really high pride of ownership. They really take care of their own park, uh, sorry, own home. They mow their yard, you know. Uh, also, lawn care is not on the landlord. Lawn care is on the tenants themselves because they own the home and they rent the lot. So any grass that grows on their lot is their responsibility if they own the home. So, you know, as the landlord, you only mow the common area. So yeah, so usually there is a person who serves as the eyes and ears of the park. And yeah. interesting, how do you compensate that person? So something that people do, um, which we would never do, is to give them free rent. Um, we don't do that. We, you know, they can be the eyes and ears of the park. We bill them. Well, they they can send us the invoice of how many hours they worked. Um, you know, how many, how, how many tasks they've completed and they bill us, we pay them based on their hourly rate, but we don't just give them, you know, free rent. The reason being is that if you give them $0 rent, and if you want to raise rent, they're getting a 270000 sorry, $275 uh, rent increase, which is not fun for anybody. And that makes it easier to manage as well. Sure, sure. And I imagine with smaller parks, it's also a, you know, it's a larger percentage of, of the park's revenue. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what does the oh oh tell us about the common areas are there are the common areas taken care of by the park or are they all is there like a park hoa fee for them how, how do you take care of those Probably. so yeah so the park takes care of them uh, so the common area like the sign there you know if there are any like um anything that they're well we don't really deal with clubhouses they're more more work than than it's worth but um so the sign and the entrance so whatever is the common areas is on the park so and including utilities so if the utility line the, the park is in charge of utilities not the water itself but like if the line breaks the repair cost is on the park from the entrance of the park to the home itself. Anything with, within the home is on the homeowner, which is the tenant. But anything outside of the home inside the park is on the park. So the park is in charge of inf uh, utility structures, infrastructure. All right, it looks like most of the rest of the questions focus on the investors in this. <laughs> and so I guess start off with how, how do you actually structure your deals? Are they Great question. It's actually in one of my uh, presentation, but I, I, um, I think I didn't, I didn't share that. I wanted to focus on the, the park. So can you see my screen? Daniel, can you yes, see my we screen? Can. We can. Okay, perfect. Perfect, perfect. So how we structure the deal, right? So here it is. I think I can find it. Okay, here it is. <clears throat> Investor distribute finance. So okay, there we go. Deal structure. So why is it not? Sorry, guys. Here we go. So can you see on my screen financing and deal structure? Yes. Okay, perfect. So 
you know, how we structure our deal, we, you know, capital raise 99,000. Usually when we get the deal and we just send it to our investor data, database or, um, you know, the investor in our network. Um, so we have a waterfall structure. We have an 8% preferred rate of return. What the preferred rate of return is, is the syndication um, deal. So um, the 8 preferred, I'm sorry, 8% preferred rate of return is when, the best way to say it is, you know, we don't get paid until you get your 8%. So that renews on an annual basis too. Let's say you did not get your 8% the first year because the first year usually stabilization period. You do not get your 8% the, the first year. I'm sorry for the noise. Um, you don't get your 8% for the first year. The deficiency carries over to the second year and you'll be always made whole. So let's say we, we hit our 8% preferred rate of return the first year. That's 100% to investor until this hurdle is hit. And then the cash flow gets split 70, 30, 70 being investor, 32 the sponsor, which is us. And then it jumps by four point every hurdle. After we achieve the 20, 12% hurdle, a 60, 40% split, 60% to investor and 40 to sponsor. And after 16% return is achieved, which is pretty high in a particular year that is given, right? So it renews every year in a 50-50 split and it stops there. It renews every year, right? And that, that's our targeted RRR after we exit. So the distribution, this is kind of in detail what, what, is, what, what it means. Um, you know, make cash distributions during using a waterfall method. There will be no return of principal invested until we sell or refinance the asset. So all of the things that you are receiving, that's return on your investment. So- How often um, do you do distributions? Every month. So this kind of talks about when we do it. So please note, distributions are made monthly by the 15th of the month with regards to previous month activities. The distribution cycle resets every 12 months. So every month on the 15th, you get three things. One is the electronic check, pretty much. It's the ACH transfer online deposit. You get it in your bank account on the 15th of the month, right? If the 15th falls on the holiday, then it's the next business day. So usually it's 15th of the month. That's the first thing. The second thing is the accounting reports. You see a PL statement from, from us. Though all of those will be uploaded to our investor portal online. So that's where we do, do a lot of our communication. Of course, I'm available through email as well. And 15th, your financial statements, a cash flow statements. You can see the activities through those official accounting reports. Number three is called a monthly snapshot. What we do is that we kind of break the park into four sectors. One is tenant, repairs and maintenance, value add activities and issues, right? So what's going on with the park the past month? So let's say, you know, May 15th, we're going to send our investors the money, the financial reports and the monthly snapshot talking about the park. So you will understand why you're getting, you know, more money this month than last month, okay? Because we raise rent because the, you know, operating expenses went down because of this is happening and you will have you have kind of anticipated, you know, level of okay, so this is happening with the park, so I'm anticipating the park to have to do this. Let's say we have to evict someone, so that will be on the report as well. So that's a way to kind of keep investors, you know, informed from a qualitative perspective and the financial reports are there to keep investors informed from a you know quantitative perspective. So, okay. and R when really we sell, yeah, go ahead. Question: What what software do you use to track all of it and create? So the we work with yeah we we work with a company called Update Capital. Um, so they you know sponsor a software. So it's an online portal. Um, you know that there you can uh, get access to your account. You can see all the investments you have with us. You can see your distributions. You can download your distributions. You can see the trends. There, there are all sorts of good and, stuff with that software. Yeah. And uh, is there a cost segregation study on the park? And and are these just structured as a five hundred six B? Yes, they're structured as five hundred six B. Yes, for now. How so, uh, how costly yes. are the legal? Uh, the lawyer's fees for doing that on a hundred thousand dollar park. I, I would imagine that's a mm -hmm. significant amount of the. Cost. No, well, this well because it's five hundred six B. We actually, you know, Johns Creek Capital actually shouldered a lot of the cost uh, front up front. So okay. you know, each individual each individual deal actually does not shoulder 
does not have much legal cost from the 506B. And we've have we've done this for a few years at this point, and we've pretty much established a system to do the 506B. And we have an internal process for our team, our compliance officer, you know, files the form D with SEC and you know, it's pr- pretty, pretty simple. And for, for you guys listening uh, on the call, you know, you know, so that's, this is how kind of is that this is why I'm presenting a, a past deal, because let's say one of you guys wants to invest with us for a future deal. Um, then how it would go is that you have to re- we, we, we'll talk on the phone. And then once we've talked, establish that relationship um, then I can send you a new deal. So yeah, so SEC, I mean, sorry, it's 506B or C, you know, it really is, um, you, you know, there to, you have to depend on how, how big of a deal you have for for our deal size, 506B is fine. And legal fees, you know, those are upfront. And like I said, those were shouldered a lot of it by Johns Creek Capital and some of the initial deals. And we have the paperwork down. We have our legal documents down. And our attorney actually do not need to be, he doesn't need to be involved in every deal. So the what, legal- what type of depreciation and tax benefits do uh, the investors That get? is a excellent question. Let me see. Um, the tax, yeah. So mobile home parks actually have a. Let me see my share my screen again. Um, here. So we can here, just, I just you know, we article. have five minutes left in our meeting. You got it. So the the, the tax benefits mobile home parks. I'm sharing the screen on um, you know what what I mean. I can send this to you as well. So um, it has a shorter depreciation, uh, accelerated depreciation s- schedule than mobile home parks. So. The cost segregation study, we don't necessarily do a cost seg, but we do an infrastructure study, you know, every year to inspect the park to see what is depreciable. And we, we, work, we work with a, a CPA that specializes in mobile home park tax depreciation. So uh, we provide our K-1s every year, a month before the due date, and uh, investors are very pretty satisfied with the amount of tax benefits they get. So, and this article says it very well on mobile home park uh, tax depreciations. I mean, depreciations, yeah. You can depreciate the utility lines, uh, septic tanks if they're on one, and any kind of buildings there. So, and that's right. another other undertaking. Yeah. What, what is your definition of a small mobile home park? A How small do you classify mobile home small, parks, medium, large? Yeah, so a small is anywhere from a 10 to 50. That's a small, five to 50, actually. Yeah, that's a small. So a, a medium is 50, 100. A large is 100 and above. And if you want to go really large, it's a thousand pads. I just know, I know someone who just got a four thousand pad mobile home park portfolio, and that's insane, right? That makes him the the number one owner in the state, and that's really big. So <laughs> there are different tiers for sure, and you know all the tiers have profits to make, and that's our niche is small parks, which we have high cap rates, and we're very comfortable and attracted to this space because of the niche. And then lastly, what criteria do you use to sell a park? Yeah, we have a acquisition algorithm with 15 different parameters with the weights assigned to it and a score we assign to it when, once we see a deal. We also have a disposition algorithm, which is a very nerdy way to think, right? So, so you know, our disposition algorithm have, you know, different parameters as well. For example, um, how far are we from completing all of our value add activities? You know, what we tell our investors what we're going to do and what we actually did, you know, we want to make sure we, we do what we say we're going to do. So that's one. And another one is the market condition, right? And number three is the tenant condition, right? How many people are, people are paying? How stabilized is the park, right? You don't want to sell, sell an asset where um, you're not going to get the top dollar for it. We don't want that, right? So, and um, another thing is, you know, how far... You know um, how our how how is our cash reserve account doing, right? So if we have done all of the value activities, we have achieved the NOI we want to sell, um, and then the cash reserve is going down a little bit, then you may you may consider selling. And another thing is the biggest thing is if we sell right now, is it or is it not going to meet or exceed? Our projected internal rate of return, annualized return, and equity multiple. Those are the most expensive, sorry, most uh, important parameters. If it's not going to achieve the returns we want, then it's probably not going to be a good time to sell. So that's those are just some examples of the parameters. And then Charlotte, lastly, how can people reach out to you? 
Yeah, the best way to reach out to me is to go to our website at Johns Creek Capital. If you're looking at the screen, here is the website, johnscreekcapital.com, or you can email me directly since we're on this call uh, at cdunford at johnscreekcapital.com. All right, everybody, can you take yourselves off mute and thank Charlotte for coming here and talking with us? Thanks, Charlotte. Thank, thank you, guys. You. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> really interesting. Thank you. Perfect. Thank, thank you, you yeah. guys. And thank Very you, Daniel, for hosting this and inviting me. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks, Daniel. And uh, just to let everybody know, next week we have a speaker who's going to be coming in and talking about self storage. So we're going to try a couple of different asset classes. And after that, I believe we also have a person coming in and speaking about notes, but large scale bank notes. Perfect. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Thank you so much for you. inviting me. He's been good. All right. Bye. I'll talk to you later. Bye bye.